Glad you made it. Hello, Houston. We're just sitting here uh, gabbing back and forth. Glad you were able to join us today. We're going to uh, continue our tour into um, uh, testing of intelligence today, and, and essentially we've kind of looked at one of the traditional measures of IQ. We're going to look at another one today, and also some variations that are even more recent than, than either of the first two we've looked at. Just by way of reminder, I wanted to indicate to you that this was the kind of the review that we rushed through right near the end um, about how you go about calculating um, the IQ in terms of the Stanford Binet. And in fact, the thing that I did want to point out again, just to make sure you understand it, is the formula down at the bottom. That was attributable to a German psychologist by the name of William Stern. And although Binet gets a lot of credit for having created it, actually he didn't. It was a German psychologist who came up with the idea that intelligence quotient is basically some measure of mental skill divided by chronological age. And that, in fact, is the way in which the underlying assumptions that Binet and group made when originally uh, developing the IQ test. That is, by putting the chronological age in the denominator, what that forces us to do in order to handle or cover or maintain a constant IQ um, is that we have to continue mastering information. Now, that's going to cause a series of problems for us because you do not continue getting smarter and smarter and smarter. Near as we can tell from the study of human activity, the smartest year is college sophomore. And from there on, it's downhill. Um, as you begin, gradually begin to realize how much you don't actually know um, and come to grips with it. Uh, now, I tease about that. But in fact, that is a problem with the Stanford Binet. And that is the fact that putting the chronological age in the denominator immediately puts some limits on how smart you can get, uh, as we'll see here a little bit later. And other tests are going to react to adapt or correct that problem as we get into it. But in any case, it's a measure of behavior over a measure of, of chronological ability. And the point is that, in essence, you can become, you can have an IQ of 106. My um, Vijay was very annoyed when he, when he said that I was reporting that Kristen, his sister, has an IQ of 106. She doesn't. I'm, I am burdened by him to point out that that was simply an exemplar. Um, she's actually got a PhD and works now at Oregon State University. So she survived remarkably well. Um, but the point is that um, um, what we've got there is a measure of behavior. And in essence, when we talk about mental age, you'll remember that I defined that in either of two ways, either the mental age of the item or the average age of people passing an item. In this case, we're defining mental age for a person who takes a test in terms of the average age of the people who can pass the items that this person can, can, um, can pass. So the net result is then that you can have an IQ of 106 or 130 anytime you overachieve relative to people of your chronological age. All right? That's the point that I really needed to make relative to that. And then let's go on and look at a couple of problems that are related to the, the Stanford Binet as we move into looking at the Wexler, which is the other major test that I want to, want to cover today. Um, one, of the, one of the problems is directly a function of how it was created originally. And that is the fact that the Stanford Binet was designed only to test children. And in fact, that's a strength. It does a very good job in, in high school and, and uh, middle school and elementary school. But it really was not intended to test the adult world originally. Um, a second major problem has to do with the fact that, in, a, in essence, it is entirely a verbal test. And as we're going to see here a little bit later, there are some number of skills that we have which, in fact, are, are performance-oriented rather than verbal. So it's a verbally-oriented test. Well, I covered the points in the wrong order, but at least they're listed there. Um, and and the, the second is the age-related problem, the age limits on the, on the nature of the, of the Stanford Binet as a test. That, in turn, then puts us into a discussion of the other major traditional type of, of test of intelligence. And those are the Wexler tests, named after David Wexler, who started developing them back in the, the 1940s and 50s. Um, and he's now actually in the second or third edition of, of each of these tests, um, as we'll see as we get into it. But if we look at the differences between the Wexler scale as it was originally developed and the Stanford Binet, the traditional SBIS, um, there are several obvious differences. One is the fact that, that the, the Wexler tests, that is the subtests, are organized to, to test a very different set of abilities. And they're arrayed um, in, in order of difficulty. In the Stanford Binet, as you remember, because the other assumption, that is one assumption was that intelligence was age-related, the other assumption that Binet made was that 
uh, intelligence is multifaceted. That involves a, a lot. That is, it involves a lot of different skills. And so, in essence, any one skill is only tested at a particular age, which is another way of saying that for each of the six tests at a given year, you're only going to see them that year. Move to the next year of the test, you've got a different set of six tests that you're involved with. So, in essence, in this case, what what the Wexler does is to organize scales. Um, or organize, uh, they tap a slightly different set of abilities, as we'll see here shortly. Uh, and each, within each ability, the tests are arranged in order of difficulty. So you're going to face the same test, regardless of whether you're taking the adult version or the later developed ones for children and preschoolers, as we'll see. So that's one difference, comparing the Sanford Binet to the Wexler. A second has to do with the fact that the, the Wexler tests both verbal skills and performance. And in fact, as we're going to see when we get into looking at the results, it actually gives us at least two, in fact, seven different measures of IQ in the most recent versions of the, um, of the test. But the, one of the primary differences is that it tests performance skills in addition to um, the, the verbal skills that have traditionally been tested so effectively by the Stanford Binet. Third factor is that the Stanford, the, the Wexler, can actually be used to, to aid in the diagnosis of certain forms of psychiatric disorders. We're not going to go into that because that's not our purpose in talking about it here. But it is, in fact, a, a benefit, um, an additional benefit of the Wexler scales and, and the concepts that they use. And finally, uh, perhaps most obviously, the Wexler was intended primarily for adults. Because in essence, what happens is that, that the, the Stanford Binet, the traditional formula, caps out in the 19th year. That is, if I were to take that test as, as a 61-year-old, the denominator in that scale would be calculated around 19 or 20 years of age. And what that's essentially saying in terms of test development is that we can't write a question, or put it the other way, we can write a question that the average 16-year-old could answer that the average 15-year-old could not. But we are not able to write a question that the average 30-year-old could answer that the average 29-year-old could not. The point is that our world knowledge kind of reaches some, some asymptote or some level um, where the general knowledge base is established by the time you reach about age 19 or 20. And because of that, the Stanford Binet loses its, its ability to differentiate people strictly on, on the basis of mastery of, of world knowledge by the time you reach the late teens or early 20s. So it is capped just by the very nature of, of the way in which it's, it's constituted. By contrast, then, the, um, the Wexler uh, is developed and targeted specifically for um, the, the adult population. And I don't mean just Wexler. What I should say specifically is the WACE, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. Um, and in fact, this is a test which is in its third version. The original one was published in 1955. The current version was published in 1999, and this is the third version that has been created. So it is referred to typically by the Roman numerals there as WACE 3. Uh, but when I talk about, if I slip and talk about WACE, I'm talking simply about the third version, the most recent version of that test. Now that, the subtests in the Wexler are several fold. Um, first of all, and I guess this is where we ended last time, um, there are a series of, of seven tests that are tapping into a wide variety of verbal scales, verbal skills, I should say. Um, these overlap substantially with the tests that are, that are or the, the skills that are tested by the um, Stanford Binet in its, traditional, um, in its traditional version. But in each of these instances, it is related to uh, verbal skills, purely verbal skills of, of whatever type. Um, ranging from digit span memory, where we will, among other things, read numbers of increasing lengths to you, um, all the way to um, um, general information, um, what's wrong with a, um, uh, well, that's from the Stanford Binet. In any case, general information is what's tapped um, in, the, in the verbal scales. Um, by contrast, and what really differentiates the WACE is the fact that there are an equal number of scales that are targeting performance that is manual performance of one sort or another, rather than traditional verbal skills. And in these tests, there is essentially no overlap with what's tapped by the, um, by the um, uh, Stanford Binet. The um, arithmetic test um, on the left side and tests like block design and digit symbol test and the object assembly test and the picture arrangement test are all scored basically not only for speed, but also for correctness. So there are two different measures that are being utilized in those specific uh, tests. 
The advantages of throwing in the performance test are several fold. First of all, foreigners and, and disadvantaged persons can, can be measured without language difficulties or theoretically. It reduces the language difficulties. As long as you can explain to them in their native tongue, whatever it may be, you're dealing then simply with mechanical manipulation skills, not with something that is language based. So in this way, it is a more potentially culture bias free uh, test or an unculturally biased test. Secondly, by having both the verbal and the performance scales available, we can actually generate, and we will show you, that you can generate two different IQs. You can have a measure of verbal skill and fluency, intellect, and a scale of, of performance perf um, capabilities. It does not overemphasize speed in the remaining tests, that is in the, in the verbal and the other performance scales, scales, and it's developed for and standardized on adults. These are all basically advantages of the Wechsler scale relative to the, um, the Stanford Binet. Now basically, in terms of the procedure, this is what the test itself actually looks like. This is a sample of the Wechsler adult intelligence scale. This is actually the original version, the 1955 version, but the test that I want to show you or make some comments on specifically is the, is the um, uh, block design test, which is represented by the booklet in the back, the, the furthest, the highest corner of the box, that little booklet, and the blocks themselves. Those are actually nine separate one inch square blocks or cubes, I guess I should say. And the way in which you normally give the test is to pick the cubes up as a unit and drop them off the table eight to ten inches up in such a way that they will scatter and randomize themselves when they hit the table so that there's a complete turnover from whatever the nature of the previous problem was. And once the, the person who's taking the test has got the blocks assembled generally in a working area, then the test administrator simply flips the page on the book which is, and I've got to point in the right direction, right there just to the lower left of my finger, uh, simply flips to the next page. Um, and there is a top-down view of a design involving red and white blocks or a red-white diagonally split, red-white combined block. And what you're supposed to do then is simply twist those blocks um, and create the pattern. And in that case, the accuracy and, and speed are both assessed. That is, we measure how rapidly you can match the pattern and then how accurately you're able to, to twist the blocks so that uh, you can create the, the particular pattern that's necessary there. Watch that same test later when we go through the other two versions of the test because you will see that a variation on that same block design test is there all the way down to age four, which is the lowest level that, that can be tested by the, by the uh, simplest form of this, um, of this test. So in essence, we go through and provide a, a, um, an example or we, or we test you on each of these tests. And as I said earlier, each of them is age related. Um, or difficulty organized, I should say, is what I should be saying. And so we essentially test you until you reach a point where you're simply not performing any longer and then move you on to, to the next scale. So in essence, what we do is to administer, uh, first of all, typically the, the uh, information test um, and, then, and then obtain a raw score. So in essence, your performance by the test administrator is translated into a raw score. So column one, the left column in the table here, is all that's actually calculated or recorded as you're performing. And we then repeat that for each of the, each of the other 13 tests, the total of 14 tests that are, that are available there. Um, and then um, what we do afterwards is to calculate the, the IQ. Uh, I can't mechanically show you how to do that because in essence what happens is each of the raw scores, and the pointer here is circling one of the raw scores to point out for you, these are manufactured data by the way, so don't assume that this is an immediate accurate uh, statement here, but the general principle that I'm following is the correct one in terms of how we calculate the IQ. For this particular test, a raw score of 26 then is looked up on a table and each of the individual raw score elements is then looked up on a table which table has on it the raw scores across one dimension and age down the other side. So in essence, if I'm testing someone who's 40 years of age, I'm going to go across, I'm going to take their 12, if that's what we're talking about, what was it, I'm sorry, 26 on the letter number sequencing. I'm going to move across to 26 on the table, and then I'm going to go down the table until I get to age 40. And at that intersect will be some IQ points, okay? Those are what we then copy into the second column. So in essence, the, the 12 is the number of IQ points, which 26 points on this particular test actually generates. Notice on the next test, on, on the one just above it, rather, 
the 73 for vocabulary only generates 14 IQ points. So there's actually a separate table relating performance score and age to IQ for each of the 14 tests that constitutes the, the WACE 3. All right? In turn, once we've done that, what we then do is to add up and we get what is called a scaled score. The 88 is simply the sum of these two um, sets of information. That is, is uh, the verbal scaled score is the, the performance data for the original, the, for the verbal scores, verbal tests. And the 66 represents the sum of the scaled scores for the performance-based tests. Those two scores, in turn, are then converted to what is called a verbal IQ and a performance IQ. And those are looked up separately for the, the 88 for one and the 66 for the other, which yield different IQ scores. And those two, in turn, are used to generate what is called a full-scale IQ. That is the number that is directly comparable to the Stanford Binet, with one correction that I'll show you a little bit later. But this test ends up giving you an, an IQ value that is directly comparable to the number, the single number, that you get out of the um, Stanford Binet. However, the thing that makes this a particularly interesting test in, in the modern version of it is that now we also get a series of sub-IQ scores that are represented over here called index scores. What these are attempting to do, and this really reflects the way the modern conceptualization of intelligence is shifting, as you'll see when we look at the more modern tests, it actually gives you a series of four additional index scores as noted over on the right there. A verbal comprehension score, a working memory estimate, a perceptual organization skill uh, score, and a processing speed. So you actually, when you do the complete waste for an adult, you actually get seven different measures out. The primary ones, obviously, are your verbal score and your performance score and the full-scale IQ. But you get a series of interpretive scores that also help with, with um, uh, understanding and responding to the, the final results that you get. That's the adult score. Okay, the second scale that we get to, goofy system, um, is the WISC. Notice what happens now. Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children, this test is also in its third version. And in fact, this is the way it looks. Now this is the original version, let me point out. But again, the one that I want to point out to you is the block design test at the top. Notice what's happened now. Now we've still got nine blocks, but in this case they've added a color dimension. So it's just a little bit easier. I think you can appreciate the, the abstraction, the jump between um, nine blocks only red and white and nine that are full colored. So in essence, it's a little bit more interesting. Interest level is a little bit higher. And the array of skills you can draw on is just a little bit broader when you're trying to, to come up with different color patterns. There's just a little bit more aid to somebody who's in the, the child testing range, which would be basically roughly age six or seven up to about um, 16, 17, 18, essentially just under or just overlapping with the, the adult scale. Finally, then, we go to the Wexler preschool and primary scale of intelligence. And in essence, now what we're doing is looking at what's called the WIPSI R. The R is what was used for the second version of each test. So the WIPSI has been revised, but is not out in the third edition. And let's look at what that one looks like. Notice what's happened to the block design test. Now it's down to only four cubes, and we've gone back to just red, white, and diagonal red, white. And the result is, again, as you can appreciate, this one is designed primarily for children in the age of about four to six or six and a half or seven. And now the tests are just that much easier to perform, but it's still the same basic test which is being conducted here. Okay? So in essence, we've, we have three scale, three tests, all of which now have been linked to one another in terms of certain basic elements like vocabulary, which are tested across the board and certain basic performance skills, such as the block design test, which again are also tested across the board. Um, and thus you have a comparable basis for, for comparing the scores of anybody from age four up until the top, I used to say 106, but it's actually the top out is about 89 or 90 on the Wexler adult intelligence scale. For some interesting reasons, it turns out that we have motivational problems that begin to crop up, as you'll see here a little bit later, as we get older. We old people, just don't give a hoot about IQ tests, I guess is what it boils down to, as we'll see a little bit later. Now, if we go on into the, the third section then of, of uh, Simple Psych, 
Now what we'll do is to look at some comparisons between, for instance, the Stanford Binet and the, um, and the, the Wexler. One of the major differences is that the mean for both the Wexler, Wexler's tests and the Stanford Binet is 100. There is a slight difference in standard deviation. And that means, that's one of the reasons that I, I reviewed the normal curve with you, the normal distribution earlier. Because if we, if you tested, if you're tested on the Wexler and we need the results in terms of the standard Binet, we have to do a minor mechanical adjustment to do that. The SAT1, which I also said tests IQ, um, is, is normed with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. Again, I'm not going to burden you with any details on this, uh, just as a reminder, though, that that's the reason we cater to the normal distribution um, in, in dealing with this. Now, let's actually look at what goes on in terms of, that is, why have we done all this? The, the kind of the underlying uh, question is, why? Why bother with all this? Well, in essence, what we can do is set up an, a, a, an ability scale um, level, essentially. Um, that will indicate, and if we can raise my picture or remove it for a couple minutes or maybe put me in the bottom left, you'll see what I'm talking about here. Reminding you again that the percentage of people falling within each standard deviation can be calculated directly off the normal distribution as we were just looking at it. But here what you see is that the vast majority of us, um, essentially 95% of us, 96% of us almost, fall within two standard deviations of the mean. That is, the vast majority on the traditional Stanford Binet would have an IQ between 70 and 130. Much more attention, interestingly enough, has been paid to people at the lower end of this scale rather than the upper end. Certain states do now have charter schools or, or governor's schools, is what I really should say. Charter school is used differently here in Texas. Um, but governor's schools, where they will create a kind of a Stanford for the state or something like that, or a Rice for the state, um, where the best and the brightest are encouraged and pooled together into that kind of a school. But interestingly enough, we largely ignore the best and the brightest in our country until we get to, to at least undergraduate school, um, and in some ways even more so into graduate school. But at the other end, uh, at the lower end of, of intellectual skills, there are actually quite an array of help sources available to us. And there are a series of terms related to IQ at each of these different levels. If you score in the range of 55 to 69 on the Stanford Binet, you were traditionally called a moron. If you were scoring between 40 and 54, you were called an imbecile. And anything below 40, you were considered to be an, an idiot. Now that used to aid traffic flow in the cities because if somebody did something particularly stupid in front of you, you could roll down the side window and yell out at them and label very precisely exactly how stupid you thought they were, whether a moron, an imbecile, or an idiot. But then the American Mental Health Association, and obviously I'm teasing, but the American Mental Health Association got hold of that, those labels and noted the fact that a great deal of negative social affect was being associated with the use of the labels. And because of that, they began what became a successful campaign to change the use of the labels. Because there really was not an intent to judge social awkwardness by these labels. It was simply an intent to label intellectual ability, and that's all. And because of that, they have now switched to where we refer to degrees of mental retardation instead. And so instead, what we refer to somebody who used to have been called a moron would now instead be called simply somebody who is mildly mentally retarded. If you remember the, the um, the TV series, L.A. Law, which has been syndicated since, the office boy in that TV series was actually playing a person who was mildly mentally retarded. The other phrase that is also used is that he was considered to be an EMR, or an educable mental retardate. That is, with schooling, Benny, who was the youngster, the, the person in that program, uh, was perfectly capable of maintaining his own apartment. He had a girlfriend. He had the normal array of, of social skills, somewhat limited by his, his intellectual limits. And the only time he really needed help was when things got particularly complex, like his girlfriend became orthogonal with him on this, that, or the other issue, or whatever. And then he might need some help in kind of sorting it out. But in general, in terms of getting himself to work and going home, in terms of being responsible, holding a job, no problem. That, that would be typical of somebody who is mildly mentally retarded. The second level, then, is somebody who is moderately mentally retarded. Those are generally considered to be TMRs, or trainable mental retardates. Um, and they can do semi-skilled work, uh, assembly line work, but they have relatively little resistance to stress um, and really need to be, to be supervised fairly closely in any kind of uh, complex process. Um, and finally then, those who are severely mentally retarded can sometimes help support themselves, um, but, if, but they have to be completely supervised 
uh, and really exhibit only minimal functioning. There is a reason why the scale drops off at 25, because by the time you get down to that level, you have problems understanding or being sure that the person being tested actually has the motivation and the understanding to understand why it is necessary to try hard on those tests, that is to do the best you can. And if we can't really guarantee that, we can't really test or assign fairly IQ. And anything below about 25 really is, is a person who is untestable. So at some level, you really can't measure IQ below about uh, 25, at least using these instruments. Uh, it's not possible to, um, to do so. Um, another kind of, of um, thing that we can do here, if we can get our crack machine, there is a, a goofiness in this thing today that is uh, giving us difficulties. Let me beat on it. I'll try the old traditional uh, fix-up device. Uh, we may do the whole thing by, uh, by show of hands here. I was going to show you now a nice classy curve that basically um, looks at IQ as a function of job. It's a bar graph that basically starts at the top with high school um, um, math teachers as one of the very top ones. Um, and there, what it showed is, is the 25th and 75th percentile for that graph. And in that case, the lowest IQ for a high school math teacher was about 95 or 96, and the highest was up around 140, 142. Um, I was going to apologize for the inability to get that graph on the curve uh, because there was no room for professors up at the top. It, you just couldn't run the thing far enough over to the right indicating high IQ. But that's just a limit of the media, uh, another of which we've seen today because this thing isn't working. Um, at the other end, um, you look at things like farmhands, whose IQ is down around 92, with a range down to about 42 or 43, up to about 130 for the 25th and the 75th percentile. It's very tempting to look at that graph and say, basically, well, if you're a farmhand, if you're a mechanic, if you're a miner, you're stupid. And if you're, if you're a, a college, well, I won't say that, but if, if you're an accountant or a lawyer or an engineer, you're smart. But I think the more important thing to notice, and if you can kind of imagine all of these bars with massive overlaps, I think the really more important lesson in that kind of data is the overlap that exists, not the fact that there are relatively minor differences in the IQ. The, to give you a particular example on the one I'm reading off of, if you're at the 75th percentile of the minor pool, you are at the um, 80th percentile of the accountant pool, which in the graph I'm looking at is the top one. So that in essence to be, IQ in and of itself is no reason not to be almost anything you want, okay? That the, the range is so overlapping across the different careers that there really is, is no reason not to, um, not to, um, to um, attend, not to strive for essentially anything you want. I'm stunned because my computer now suddenly jumped. So I can show you an example of what trainable mental retardates and educable mental retardates actually, um, the kind of environment that they function in. The two on the left are trainable mental retardates. This was taken in an institution out in California, and we have the permission of the people to, um, to actually show you what's going on. The one on the left, it took us two hours to get this photo session set up. The one on the left worked for two hours learning to draw a triangle. In fact, he had a page in front of him that had quarter-inch heavy lines separating, you know, showing a triangular shape. And he simply learned how to position his pencil and draw in the form of a triangle for two hours. The one in the center back is working on about a 36 or 40-piece Donald Duck puzzle, about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick with about 40, 45 pieces on it most. And it took him an hour to solve the puzzle, at which point the, the um, supervisor of the ward came over and congratulated him. and they talk a little about how he'd done it and how he'd found the edge pieces and everything, and then the two of them broke the puzzle up, and it took him another hour to solve the problem. It was as if it was an almost new challenge that he'd not previously seen. I mean, he was developing the general skill, but in terms of specifics, there was relatively little carryover from the first to the second test um, opportunity to solve the puzzle. The lady on the right is an educable mental retardate. She's actually working on a book, uh, worked on a book in, in, the, um, in the session there that involves teaching her arithmetic in the context of where she'd be likely to use it. So what she's solving is various problems like, if you go into the drugstore and buy a tube of toothpaste for 89 cents, and you give the man a dollar, circle the change that you would give to the clerk, and what would you get back? I said, man, I should have said clerk. Okay, when you give to the clerk, circle the change that you would give to the clerk, and there would be a limited number of coins, like you know any of us might have in our purse or pocket, um, and circle the change that you would get back. 
So in essence, what she had to do was to write down, she had to total the coins, which gave her practice in adding. She had to subtract from that the cost of the purchase, and then had to, sub uh, had to get the, the difference, and then translate that back to coins. And in fact, she was very effectively challenged by that for the entire two hours it took us to set up and take that one picture. But in essence, that gives you a little bit of a feel for the difference in the levels of, of education that each of these is, is, uh, is able to, um, to achieve. Now, let's shift and look at a very different way of envisioning IQ. And at least for a little while, I can, I can survive here if this thing does have another coughing fit. Um, what we're going to do is now look at the way in which the field having shifted more toward cognition has been reflected even in the way we measure intellect. Um, Robert Sternberg has developed a very interesting what is called triarchic theory of, of intelligence. And within that theory, he actually talks about three different components of theory, which in turn he then subsidiv subdivides into, in one instance, three um, subcomponents. And without overdoing you with triples here, let me just give you a feel for what actually is involved. He wrote, rather interestingly, theories of intelligence once were defended in raging battles. Championing their competing theories, intellectual giants like Spearman and Thurstone led their armies through hard-fought campaigns. Each battle was headline news in the, worlds of psych in the world of psychology. The generals eventually passed away, the armies retreated, the soldiers deserted. The battlefield of intelligence lay quiet. And in essence, what he described was the fact that after a great deal of work in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, for about 20 or 30 years, not much happened. And then all of a sudden, within about two years, two people, Sternberg and Gardner, whose work we'll get to here in a little bit, published major pieces looking at a very different way of, of testing intelligence. And in essence, what, what, um, what Sternberg did was to propose this triarchic theory, which is essentially a componential analysis. Of, of intelligence, and he's got three different components. What he's, what he's talking about when he talks about a component is essentially an elementary information process that operates upon internal representations of objects or symbols. So the one is a process or an understanding of a procedure, and the other is the intellectual facilities that we use to, to process it, okay? Very different view of intelligence than, than, the, than the earlier attempts represented. What he suggests is, that we have three different components that make up the, the componential portion of, of uh, intelligence uh, as he envisioned it. And so in essence, one of these is knowledge acquisition. That's basically the verbal part of what was involved in the Stanford-Binet test. That is, Stanford-Binet, given the modern conceptualizations, really tapped almost exclusively knowledge acquisition. And Sternberg is leading toward making a suggestion about ways in which we really need to change our conceptualization of, of uh, intelligence. The second thing that he talks about is the need for performance skills, that is the ability to perform, operate with the various skills that we're, that we're testing here or the knowledge that we've accomplished. And so in essence, this skill then, or the, the knowledge itself, has a second component related to it, and those are basically the performance skills that we accomplish. And as we gain those skills, in turn, this begins to impact the knowledge that we accumulate. So he's arguing, basically, that the second element is what was added by the Wechsler scales. That is, it was by the time the Wechsler scales were developed in the 1950s, we now have pretty implicit acknowledgement that it isn't just the verbal skills we've got, but also what we do with them, how we perform, that also becomes important. It's at this point that Sternberg makes one of the major contributions that his theory is, is now well noted for, and that is, if you think about when you solve a problem in an algebra class or anything like that, you walk in one day and the teacher says, surprise, we're going to have a test today. And they give you the test. And you slave away on your understanding of this particular uh, polynomial, trying to solve for x and y and z and q and all the other letters they've thrown in there randomly. It always seemed to me. Um, and you realize 10 minutes into this test, I am getting nowhere on this approach. And at some level, what eventually happens is you scrap that. You literally tear it up or put a big X through it, flip to the next page, and start over again. Sternberg is arguing that there is nothing in the knowledge acquisition or the performance skills that accounts for that activity. And in essence, what he's really identifying is what is referred to as metacognition. And that's what his theory really focuses on. That is, that, or, or adds as, as an additional focus is what I should say. And that is that we really have a third level or component above the knowledge and the skills we have in applying that knowledge that really represents essentially what he calls executive processes. That is, over and above 
the performance skills that we have and the knowledge that we've accumulated, there is a certain amount of skill or, or cognition, if you want, that goes into nothing more than understanding how we end up using those skills. When do we apply them? How do we utilize them? And that's essentially the how do you solve the math problem kind of logic that's represented there. And he has been about the business of developing tests that will assess each of these different interactions because he's arguing that both the, the knowledge acquisition and the performance skills interact with and impact the executive processes which in turn impact which knowledge you draw on and what processes you end up studying at any given time. So this is a, a reasonably inclusive model of the, of the component element of, of, um, of Sternberg's theory. He also then talks about experiential intelligence by which what he's really dealing with there, and I'm not going to go into a, a division of this as much as I did the other two, but in essence what he's talking about is essentially world gained experience. Your ability to know how to assess an environment, how to operate within it, and, and so forth. And finally then, the contextual in, uh, uh, intelligence, which is the third leg of what he describes as a three-legged stool again, um, in which essentially what you're concerned with there is, is the, the, the environment. It's not just an assessment of the environment, but an interaction between how does that environment impact what I need to do with the skills I've got. So those are the three major components, and what I showed you initially was a breakdown of the three major components of what is called the componential factor, or the componential intelligence, as he envisions it. Not confused yet? Hang on a second. We've got one more left turn to make. And now my computer is not going to allow me to make left turns again, so we'll see what happens. In essence, basically, what, what arrived then is a theory of multiple intelligences, and this was the work of Gardner, Howard Gardner, who published a, a fascinating, actually it was an award-winning book by the um, American Psychological Association, award-winning by the American Psychological Association, um, describing basically um, a very different theory of intelligence, and I don't need the diagrams as much basically to describe this. What Gardner was basically talking about is the idea that, that what he's trying to do is come up with an, essentially an evolution-based theory of, of intelligence. And he argues essentially that our mental skills are based, as he said, on a number of different intellectual strings, each of which may have its own developmental history. And he's also arguing that we may be very strong in one area and quite weak in any of a number of several other areas, which he is still in the process of identifying. But that in essence, what an intellectual competence, as he's talking about it, involves is essentially problem solving skills. And if you think about life as you and I enjoy it, We've got problems that we solve in a lot of different areas. You may or may not be a good dancer. You may or may not be a good mathematician. You may or may not be a good lawnmower or athlete or any of a number of other kind of things. And those he's basically arguing are different kinds of intelligence. And so in essence to identify each of the eight different types of intelligence that he now um, identifies, um, he actually talks about the importance of um, eight signs of intelligence. The eight include the following. One is the idea that you have to have the potential for isolating the, the, um, the, the skill by brain damage. Uh, by, uh, not by brain, yes, by brain damage. That is that what might happen is that by damaging a particular area of your brain, you may lose one of the different intelligences that I'm talking about, he's talking about, without losing any other. So that selected brain damage is one evidence of the idea that there is an ability uh, reflecting one of the intelligences as he labels it. A second sign um, important to the, to the development of this um, is the idea of the existence of idiot savants or prodigies. Okay? Mozart was widely considered to be a prodigy in, in, um, in music. Um, one of my all-time favorite movies is Amadeus, and if you, if you ever saw that movie, the story of, of Mozart's very tragic, uh, kind of convoluted life, there's a scene in there, probably apocryphal, but it illustrates the point I wanted to make, and that is that in one of those scenes when he's at a bar drinking with his buddies, he starts um, disparaging the music of, of Salieri and talks about how simplistic it is relative to his own music. And somebody eventually challenges him to, to play some Salieri. And he says, well, let's make it interesting. Let's see if I can't do it this way. And so what he does is to have his buddies hold him up from, from the back. So he's lying on his back, and he extends his hand over his head and plays the piano this way. So he's actually lying on his back, facing with his head toward the piano, playing over his head, and he plays the piece and he plays the Salieri piece. Not only that, he does a variation on it. That's an example of something the average piano player among us would be unlikely to be able to do, right? Yes. Um, I was talking to a student earlier who is a piano teacher. 
uh, today. Um, the point is that that's, that kind of indicates a level of sophistication that most of us, regardless of our specializations, just never achieve. Um, but that kind of isolation of superior skill is a second way to identify an area of these intellectual excellences. A third is an identifiable core operation or set of operations. Mastering music involves some degree of skill in math, for instance, because of the regularities that are there in terms of, of chord structure and so forth and so on. Um, a fourth is a distinctive developmental history. That is, in essence, what we really need is, is um, um, a, a history that leads to a kind of an identifiable end state or a set of skills in a particular content area. Fifthly, there has to be an evolutionary history and an evolutionary plausibility to why that skill ever would have developed. One of the skills, for instance, is, is basically a bodily kinesthetic skill. Um, and, and obviously, I mean, that's something that is not represented, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it, that's, that's one example of an identifiable, um, th there's a reason evolutionarily why some of us might need to be physically adept, okay? Sixth, you have to have support from experimental psychological tasks. That is, there has to be some way to isolate and test this, this, in, this intelligence if we're going to have it be of any use to us. There has to be support from psychometric findings that is some degree of relation between the construct itself and our, our ability to measure it. And finally then, susceptibility to encode it in a symbol system. That is, you have to be able to abstract it in some way so that we can carry it around in our head. And he actually identifies uh, eight different types of intelligence. And, and within the simple book, psych book there is a, um, a listing of, of the specific elements that are, that are involved. Uh, and my computer is not going to do anything, so I'll just, uh, I will rely on you to look in the book and, and see it. One of the recent, what he did was to bump it from six originally, which involved linguistic, musical, logical, mathematical, spatial, bodily kinesthetic, and personal. Personal has now been split, most recently, into interpersonal, which is interactive, as opposed to intrapersonal, that is, within um, each of us. There are at least two major areas in this assessment of intelligence which bear no overlap at all with either the Wexler approach or the earlier Stanford uh, slash Stanford Binet uh, approach. One of these is bodily kinesthetic skill. Uh, the idea that although the Wexler did tap into performance skill generally, there was no way that an athlete like um, uh, Hakeem Olajuwon, for instance, who is brilliant as an athlete and has been for years, there was nothing in the Stanford Binet or the Wexler that would have allowed that kind of skill ever to show through. In the modern test developed by Gardner, in fact, it does. That is, there is a, um, there is a, um, um, a test specifically for bodily kinesthetic uh, skills. You had a question? Good question. My bet would be no. Um, but the, the point would be that, um, and you, you raise a very interesting question there that essentially is going to look at the interaction among different skills. Um, the point that I would make, for instance, is, is to note that people who are, are deaf learn to counteract by, by um, I'm sorry, not deaf, are blind learn to counteract so that they can walk down a hallway like the one in the psychology building here on campus, which has a lot of hard surfaces on it, and they can actually hear the reflections off objects that are in the hallway and walk around them, where you and I would may think it, it's like some kind of a seventh body sense or something. In fact, it's simply learning to react to signals that because we are sighted, you and I don't have to process. So in essence, there could be compensatory uh, things that, that have to occur in other areas, but I'm not aware that that has been worked down into the, the, um, the physically handicapped range, uh, particularly for things like the bodily kinesthetic. The other one that has, has newly arrived is the assessment of interpersonal skills, and essentially what that allows us to do is to tap into people who are um, um, executives, for instance. I mean, there was no previous way to identify excellence in terms of, of uh, executive performance or, you know, who becomes leader of, of, the, of the university. Um, our president, I'm sure, does not know as much uh, political science as Professor, Le as Professor Lentz on our, uh, on our faculty, probably doesn't know as much psychology as I do, and so forth. And that's not to say that I'm better or worse than him. It is simply to say that, that President Smith's skills and excellences clearly are in the interpersonal area. That is, he's extraordinarily good at interacting with people and, and representing the, the university, which is the job of a president chancellor externally to other groups. 
So in essence, the, the ability to tap executive potential is only possible in the, in the test that, that, um, that Sternberg has actually, um, uh, I'm sorry, that, that Howard Gardner has actually developed in, in, this, um, in this kind of situation. Now, let's get into looking at um, heritability. And that is the, the, the question is essentially what are the factors that actually influence intelligence? Obviously, it's going to be heredity and environment. But let's look at the, the different kind of factors here. First of all, when we look at genetic relationship, there turns out to be a very direct correlation between the, um, the ability to um, predict IQ and the degree of genetic relationship. If we actually take any two people randomly off the street and give them an IQ test, those two tests will correlate slightly positively. The reason being that anybody who does not have IQ or is extremely low, below 25, is not going to be out on the street anyway. Okay, so there'll be even a slight correlation between two people who are totally genetically unrelated to each other. But as you move up the scale, by the time you get to um, parent and child, the correlation is up to about 0.5 with a range from uh, about 0.2 to 0.8, where 1.0 would be a perfect correlation. By the time you get to identical twins reared together, you are up to a correlation of about 0.9, 0.92. You are at the testing limits of the correlation of the of the traditional tests of, of intelligence itself. So the point is that if we test one identical twin on an IQ test, we can actually predict the IQ of the other one as as well as we can if we test that other twin. Okay? So that there is that would argue that there is a basis for a genetic relationship in IQ. The problem is that most of the data on which those kind of assessments are based has subsequent to his death been challenged severely in the work of Sir Cyril Burt, a British psychologist who argued and campaigned massively that it was all genetics. And unfortunately, there, was, there were evidence that came up after his death that he had jimmied the data. In, in studies that were as much as 30 years apart on similar variables, he was reporting identical correlations. And in a variable, as, in an area as loose as this one is, that just does not happen. Uh, so there's reason to suspect it. Um, but it can also be pointed out that even in his data, if you talk about identical twins reared separately, that is in totally different environments, the correlation among their IQs drops, the average correlation drops to about 0.78. Um, and so there is at least some room for, for environmental impact in, in, these, um, in these situations. Another one then that I want to look at is environmental factors, and there are several I can mention. We won't get through all of them today, but Shai and Struther did a fascinating experiment, a cross-sectional measure of IQ in which they measured IQ for 50 people at each age level from, from 25 to 70. In other words, 10 groups, 50 each. And that's the declining curve that you see in the simple psych book there. The cross-sectional assessment of intelligence shows that it drops with age, which means I'm dumber than you are, except there is what's called a cohort effect. A cohort effect argues that the life experiences that I've had as a six-year-old is different from those of you in the viewing audience who are 20. In addition, your education is better than mine likely was. We will pick up on a discussion of why those impact and alter, give a different version of IQ ability as a function of age next lecture.